There are few things worse than negligent parenting. A parent who just lets their kids do whatever, almost never jumps in and deals with them and brings discipline into their life like the child needs, correction, setting them on the right course. Negligent parenting that doesn't do that destroys a child. Child needs boundaries, parameters, limitations, needs to know what's right and wrong, where I can go, where I can't go, and to not do that sets them off on a terrible course in life. The people of Israel are, uh, they're in a spot, they're in a bad place where though they have their own sins and problems, what they're doing is they're looking at God and they have two real accusations they're making against God. And in a lot of ways it comes down to their accusing of being negligent. Uh, in Malachi chapter 3, as I've been going through this, it, the questions that they have, the accusations really that they have against God are these. Number one, does God approve of evil? And number two, why doesn't he act? If God doesn't approve of evil, why isn't he acting? Why isn't he intervening into this scenario? Because as I look at things, it seems that the, the wicked are getting away with a lot. Don't you think that sometimes too? In our culture, don't you see a lot of wicked people getting away with stuff that you're like, why doesn't God just zap them? Don't you see a lot of villains getting away with crime? And you wonder, where is God? Why is he not acting? That's the same kind of world that they were in. That's the same kind of world they were inhabiting. They weren't different from us at all. They were people who thought that God was, if he was around, he was certainly going to vote for them. He was certainly going to back them up. And when he wasn't giving them the things that they wanted, they decide, well, God apparently applauds the evil because look how much they're thriving. Look how well they're doing. And uh, doesn't seem that God's acting. So the, the way they might say it is this, it kind of looks like God approves of evil because he's not judging people. He's not dealing with them for their sin as his word says he will. There's some faulty premises built in. There's some basic presuppositions that they have baked into their thinking before they even come to accuse God. And the first of those is that they themselves are the righteous ones. Their basic belief, their starting point is, I'm a good person, I'm a righteous person, and the way I perceive things is most likely accurate. And therefore, since I perceive things right and God's not dealing with it as he says he will, then God is a negligent parent. There's some problems with that, a lot of them. But Malachi chapter 3, verse 1, the Lord says something here. He says, I'm going to send my messenger, and he will clear the way before me. And, you know, if you're on the side of thinking that you're the righteous person, you're like, yeah. I mean, you're cheerleading that, right? You're excited that he's coming because he's going to come clear the way, and you assume that's going to clear out other people. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come into his temple. So they would claim they're really hoping for, looking for the coming of Messiah to come into the world that they might follow him and glorify him. But really what they're looking for is uh, for themselves to be exalted. They're looking to God. Uh, they're looking at him. They're smiling at God. And at the same time, they have their own kingdom in their eyes. They are not really about God and his kingdom first. They're about their own. They're considering, how is it that I can benefit from this? How do I know that? Well, if you read earlier in chapter 2 of Malachi, you see what's going on, that their hearts weren't truly co uh, committed to the Lord. Continuing on in verse 1, The Lord whom you seek will suddenly come into his temple, Jesus, of course, and the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight, behold, he is coming says the Lord of hosts. But I want to keep moving. He says in verse 2, But who can endure the day of his coming? And who can stand when he appears? For he is like refiner's fire and like fuller's soap, launderer's soap. This, of course, is the message that John the Baptist was proclaiming when he came. Remember when he talked about that? About how, you know, I, he is the one who is coming after me? And what he'll be like, how he'll refine you with fire and all of that. 
So here we, we see something that I don't think we come to terms with very readily, and that is, who can endure the day of his coming? Well, the, the response to that is the righteous. And again, the belief from the people to whom Malachi writes is that they are the righteous. So they will be happy when he's here, which is good. But let's keep reading. Who can stand? Well, no one can stand unless the one who is refining wills that they stand. And he is like a refiner's fire. You, a refining fire is exactly what he elaborates on in verse 3. He says he'll sit as a smelter and a purifier of silver. With silver, if you want to clean it up, of course, you, you pass it through the fire and you, you burn out with high heat all the impurities. What does that mean for the silver? Well, if you are the silver, that means some pain, some stuff, some dross is going to have to come off. Jesus talks about this in the New Testament in, in reference to pruning, cutting off the parts that don't help you produce fruit. That's not an easy process. That's not a painless process by any means. And here, I don't think this audience is imagining that God is going to purify them with pain and prune off the areas that, that don't allow them to be fruitful for his kingdom. They aren't following for that reason. They're not on his team for that. They're there for other reasons. And he will purify the sons of Levi and refine them like gold and silver. So again, continuing with this metaphor of cleaning up the sons of Levi, he wants the sons of Levi, the priesthood, to offer offerings, to present offerings rightly and continually. That was supposed to be going on all the time in the land of Israel. He says, this is good. He's, God is going to purify them. He's going to clean them up so that they may present to the Lord offerings in righteousness. I find it kind of interesting that many of the early church who were being saved, you find in the book of Acts, are from the Levitical tribes. I think that's really cool, but I, not really the point of what's going on here, but that is a, a reality. He says here then in verse four, then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasing to the Lord as in the days of old, as in former years. So God in responding to this first accusation that whether he approves of evil or not, of course he doesn't. The fact he's not acting in their timetable though, is a different thing. Uh, we're never on the same timetable as God. We're, we seem to always be off because I always want it in my time. I always want it now. I mean, when I'm praying for relief from something, I want it now, not six months from now. I don't see how that could be useful when I'm viewing it through the eyes of the growth of my own kingdom. And there lies my, my dilemma. God, in answering this second question though, why doesn't he act? Let's look into that. Why does he not act? Then, verse 5, I will draw near to you for judgment, and I will be a swift witness against the sorcerers and against the adulterers and against those who swear falsely, those who bear false testimony, and against those who oppress the wage earner in his wages. Don't pay people what they agreed to cheating people out of their wages, and against uh, those who are against, who oppress, excuse me, the widow and the orphan, and who turn aside the alien, and who do not fear me. So the audience that Malachi is speaking to might have been cheering and applauding back when he says in verse 2, who can endure the day of his coming? Well, only the righteous. They might, again, they might be like, yeah, but... When you get down to this, now they're going to be squirming in their seat. Uh, now they're going to be a little shaky because he goes against some things that they themselves were practicing. Maybe they weren't going to the sorcerers, so maybe you feel safe. Maybe that's a different level than the average listener to this. But then he says this, against the adulterers. Well, how does he define adulterers in the book of Malachi? Well, it's really good because you go back just the last chapter and he, he elaborates on that. Those who would commit adultery, those who divorce their wife for any reason except for 
open, immoral, adulterous relationship. That's not the definition they had for divorce. That's not, that's not how they worked out divorce. There's actually, in some of the ancient writings of the Jewish people, the grounds for divorce could simply be that a husband hates his wife. Well, that's awkward. Uh, so when he says here, against the sorcerers, and he says against the adulterers, well, that, that, who defines the adulterers? Well, God does. You don't get to come up with your own definition. And against those who swear falsely. So anyone who would be uh, willing to testify falsely against someone, lie. Uh, so again, now you're squirming in your seat a little bit. Because if you remember the cultural situation going on in Israel at this time, they got a lot of uh, hard times. And they haven't been thriving as a people. And you know what happens where there's poverty. Uh, crime tends to rise and an opportunity to, it's dog eat dog a lot of times. It's an ugly situation. People get desperate. And so quite often there's going to be a swearing of false testament. There's going to be some lying going on against the neighbor because you're just trying to survive at times. So as I said, now they're squirming in their seat because God put some detail. He didn't just leave a general statement. He got into their lives. He says, and against those who oppress the wage earner and his wages. I mean, if you're a boss, it'd be really easy to try to skim a little bit off here. Try to make as much money as you can. Uh, the guy comes in trusting you're going to pay him the right amount. And it's easy for them to find a way to not do that, not Pay them what they're worth, not pay them what you agreed to. And those who oppress the widow and the orphan. Always a top concern of the Lord, because these are people who don't stand to benefit you in any way if you help them out. That's where you can begin to see true and undefiled religion. Someone who cares about the widow, someone who cares about the orphan. Someone who cares about those who are helpless, who don't have anyone to benefit them. And not only that, but they turn aside the alien, that is the sojourner, the one who is in Israel because they want to, they've seen the benefit of being in Israel. They, they, those who God is going to be a swift witness against are these people. As I said, now they're squirming. Now they're feeling a little awkward. And then he gives a generic term at the end, those who do not fear me. So let's put it all back under kind of an umbrella. Um, who's going to be a swift witness, swift witness against? It's also going to be those who just don't fear him. And if you know the word at all, you know what fearing the Lord looks like. It looks like hating evil and doing good. So here's the reality. The people who are hearing Malachi's message were being condemned by it. Uh, there weren't many who were actually walking the line, who were actually seeking to magnify God with their life and with their choices, with how they uh, spoke, with how they treated those who didn't seem to matter in society. This is a hard message to hear. If you fear God, if you follow after him, then there will be evidence of that. And it should be apparent. There should be fruit that is born. And the only reason why this group is not going to be dealt with by the judgment of God, which they are accusing him of weakness for, is because, because God is long-suffering and patient. He is patiently putting up with them and sending them yet another prophet so that they get another chance to see their sin, turn from their wicked way and be healed. They are considering God to be negligent when what they are missing is how patient he is and how kind he is to send one servant after another to try to call them to repentance. What a grace this is that we misunderstand all the time as being a weakness or an inability to act. Remember those two questions, why does God approve of evil? And, you know, why is he not acting? He doesn't approve of evil. There's no question if he's going to deal with it. The problem is when he deals with it, you're going to be caught up in that storm. 
That's what he's telling them. When he does act, you're going to be terrified. What a tremendous reality this is for this audience that first received it. May it be the same for us as we hear these things. May we respond as we ought, respond as as Malachi himself hoped the people of Israel would respond to say, there is sin in my life that needs to be removed. I want to be holy. I want to seek his kingdom first. And then as I do that, to allow him to add unto me that which he will. I hope this is a blessing in your life as you consider your own walk with Christ and your desire to magnify him in all that you do. Thank you for joining me.